Welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. This week, join us in welcoming thought leader and prolific blogger Dave Pollard to the Poetry of Predicament podcast. Go. Um, I couldn't take the winters anymore. Hmm. The winters... I grew up in Winnipeg on the prairies where it wasn't unusual to get minus 40. <laughs> Um, and the interesting thing about minus 40 is that it's the same in both Celsius and Fahrenheit. <laughs> so you don't have to say which scale you're using when it gets down there. It's the same thing. It's just fucking cold. It, it certainly is. <laughs> oh, my God. So. <laughs> yep, so I escaped out here when I retired. I, did, uh, I spent 30 years in the going through the usual meat grinder in Ontario near Toronto, commuting an hour each way every day and uh, working 70 hour weeks and all that crazy stuff. And then uh, it was kind of shortly after I started blogging that I suddenly woke up and said, what the fuck am I doing with my life? This is yeah. crazy. Yeah. I, was a, I was something of an activist when I was a teenager and a early 20 something um i was an idealist out there demonstrating and getting arrested and all that shit uh, but then when i got into married life and child raising it uh, somehow skipped my mind for 30 years and took a while to get back to it <laughs> i spent a week there one day <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um, so I'm curious, what, what was the work you were doing? Um, I did a lot of work for a company called Ernst & Young. Oh, yeah. In, in those days, it was in Canada, it was Clarkson Gordon. It was an independent mm -hmm. organization. I joined it because I liked helping small business. I thought the idea of having to work for somebody else was kind of an abomination. Um, and so I, I spent most of my career helping small business to get started, to find money, to find people to do whatever they had to do to keep the business going. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a good, it was a good business, but, uh, I finally reached the stage at which I realized that, um, uh, I wasn't making enough of a difference to warrant you know, waking up at the age of 65 or 70 and saying, okay, now what? Um, so I had to find some meaning in my life and it was very fortunate that the, the whole experience of blogging came along at that time yeah. and woke me up. Yeah. Got it. I'm particularly uh, appreciative of meeting you and spending this time because uh, there's, there's so much in your writing that... Uh, that I've resonated with, and I um, have come to really appreciate, really savor the times when I get to be with a kindred spirit, with someone uh, who has obviously opened themselves at, at an important level uh, to what's so in the world, and engaging uh, sincerely and heartfully and thoughtfully, as I, as I believe you are. Well, thank you. That's that's good to hear. I think, to some extent, we are privileged to have had the the luxury and the time and the resources to be able to discover this truth out for ourselves, when most people just are too busy or um, not able to access the information that's necessary to actually realize what's going on in the world and how things actually work. Mm -hmm. I am with you. Yes. I remember when I was uh, interviewed by uh, Jenea and Robin. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was the time that I was interviewed jointly with Carolyn. Mm. And Jenea asked me, um, what do your th kids think about all of this? <laughs> 
you know, all of my writing about collapse and, and so on. And uh, my answer was that my kids aren't ready for this. And they have basically told me this. They occasionally read my blog. They occasionally read stuff that I kind of point them to. But they have said, you know, if we really believed what you're telling us, we wouldn't be able to go on. Um, and maybe you're right, and maybe we'll find out you're right, in which case we'll say, thanks for giving us advance notice. <laughs> but at this stage, they have to proceed with their lives on the basis that things will be able to continue essentially as usual or close to that. Yeah. And I thought that was, it was a very honest answer and it was illuminating to me that there's an awful lot of people who probably could get this. It's not that they're so much in denial, is that their enculturation and everything that they are living their lives for dictates that they continue to ignore this inconvenient truth mm -hmm. um, and proceed as if something is going to come along and fix it. Yep. Yep. Well, I'm, I might be a few minutes late on the queue, but I'm going <laughs> to just uh, mention for those who are viewing that this is the Impossible Conversation podcast, and it will also be broadcast on the Poetry of Predicament podcast. And I'm very, very pleased to be uh, welcoming Dave Pollard here, uh, who, I, who I consider to be a thought leader in these times, um, for a bit of conversation today. And so, um, Dave, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was hoping that, that uh, if you wouldn't mind a, a, just a brief history of um, when you had your official woke moment or series of woke moments that that stirred you in the direction that ended up being the considerable amount of writing that's available if someone checks out your website and your history of um, having something to say in these times uh, about the, the personal process of being a human being facing the... Right. Uh, the future and the present that we have. And also, um, I eventually hope to um, spend some time with you talking about your work with, uh, with groups, with organizations. I have a similar leaning and would love to hear uh, some of your findings uh, af after the time that you've put in. So if, if you could just take any of those pieces and start where you will and tell us a little bit about how you came to be you. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I guess after the kids had basically grown up and were on their own, and I had the largely caused by an illness that, where my doctor basically said, quit your 70 hour a week job or, or you're going to be dead in five years. You know, a lot of us, that's the, that's the wake up call. And, and it was for me. So I did that. And all of a sudden, I found myself with some time to try to figure out what actually is going on in the world and what I was meant to do. And I think there's been a series of wake up calls for me. I'm, I'm a slow learner. I basically have to read something or learn something three times. Um, some people say it's just because I'm skeptical and therefore I don't just wholesale adopt things until there's enough evidence that I will work towards them. And, I think the first one for me was when I started to study complex systems. Um, and I began to realize that everything that I was reading and everything that I was writing that said, what we need to do is, or what somebody needs to do is, or what you know, our government needs to do is, was all naive. It's, that's not how systems work. Um, complex systems basically are self-reinforcing. They will continue to uh, block all attempts to change them until they can't continue anymore. They reach the limits to growth or they reach some other constraint or something else comes out like a, like a uh, comet from outer space and all of a sudden the old system is gone and some new system has to start in its... I hate that when that happens. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I guess the book that 
pulled it all. I have on my on my blog, which is called How to Save the World, I have a Save the World reading list, which basically takes you through either the quick course, which is 10, 10 or 12 books, or the slow course, which is 70 or 80. Um, but probably the first one that really woke me up was John Gray's Straw Dogs, um, which is a dismal read. I, I gave it to some people, and when they read it, they threw it across the room and said, why in the world did you give me this incredibly depressing book? But I found it liberating. Mm -hmm. The realization that we can't save the world. And in fact, our civilization doesn't really merit saving. That uh, we will go on, albeit with probably much smaller numbers, after our civilization culture has collapsed, as all civilizations collapse. And hopefully we'll do a better job next time of uh, living in balance with the rest of the, the natural world. Um, so I guess that was the first wake-up call. And then there's been a couple since then. Um, so all of a sudden, I stopped writing advice. I stopped doing, for the most part, I stopped doing rants, although they're still kind of fun to do. You know, there's such obvious targets these days um, to blame. But the, the realization that came along with that understanding of complexity theory is that there really is no one to blame. We're all really doing our best. Um, Lawrence Cole has a song which I really love, um, which is based on, I don't know who wrote it, but it, it, the basic words are, be kind, everyone carries a heavy load. Mm. Um, and that realization was kind of the second big eye opener for me. Um, the realization that um, even... 45 and other people whose names we dare not utter are doing their best. They actually are trying to do the best thing that they can to make the world a better place. Um, and that individuals, no matter how hard we work, aren't going to change this. There's no way that by doing more recycling or by some kind of massive humanitarian uprising and consciousness raising, uh, we're going to prevent um, the changes, which I think will probably start with an economic collapse before climate change weighs in and uh, is the final straw that ends our civilization culture. But as I say, I think one of the reasons that I find it liberating rather than, um, than distressing is the realization, you know, that, that nature replenishes itself. Uh, and after we're gone either entirely or reduced to very small numbers where our impact on the world is relatively minor, um, there will still be amazing life on this planet and, and it will continue. So that was kind of the second. And then the third and most recent one, which I'm just starting to talk about now, and it's probably cost me about half of my readers because <laughs> it's just beyond the pale for a lot of them is this idea of non-duality, this idea that this whole belief, and it's quite consistent with complexity theory, um, but this whole belief that we have a separate self that has free will and control um, is basically a trick of the brain. It's an evolutionary advance that um, was developed because the brain had the capacity to do that, to look First of all, outside itself, they, they say that the brain was actually evolved to be a feature detect, detection system rather than to be an information processing system. But because they had that central power there, it developed that information processing capability as well. Um, and then all of a sudden, at one point, that feature detection system turned around and looked at itself. And the argument is that's the first time there was a self-awareness. There, there, there was a belief that everything in this world isn't one, but it, that there's a me and there's a you and there's stuff here and there's stuff out there and everything is happening to me. Everything is about me. Um, and that apparently is a relatively new evolution and um, probably, as some non-dualists say, it's a useless piece of software we would be better off without. 
Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that there is no, although some people, of course, who are into non-duality, people who read Eckhart Tolle and Adyashanti, who I was big fans of for a while, will tell you there's a path to that realization, to that enlightenment, that all of a sudden you realize that you are not separate. They're, you're just one with everything. Yep. Um, but the non-duality that makes the most sense to me as I continue to research is the one that says there is no path. That the self will end when your physical body dies. Um, or it might end earlier if at some point or other you suddenly have a glimpse. There is suddenly a glimpse or a realization that the self is an illusion and that there isn't greater there's another truth out there. Um, so that's the latest, and it's the one that my readers have found the hardest to buy, and it's cost me a lot of readers, and that's fine. I mean, my blog has always been my way of thinking out loud, and uh, I've picked up some new readers along the way and lost some along the way, and yeah. that's the way it goes. So that's where I am now. Do you have a sense of what a particular subscribers who who've gone away what it was that blew them out um i think when by implication when i said that the world couldn't be saved i was accused of being a defeatist um they said you know you have to try here's look look at all of the things that we have changed and they would of course cite you know women's suffrage the end of slavery and so on and i would say well that's very selective <laughs> Very selective uh, evidence for you. Let me give you some alternatives, and you can lay out, of course, an equal number of cases that indicate that there is a, still, of course, an enormous amount of inequality. There is still, of course, an enormous amount of slavery in the world. And um, they're just, but that was what cost me the most readers. Uh, a number of them were very hostile, and they basically said, you know, we read your stuff for five years or 10 years. Um, and we found it reassuring. Um, and my sense is that what most people are looking for in everything that they do, in their relationships, in their reading, and so on, they're looking for reassurance, they're looking for attention, and or they're looking for appreciation. Different people and different mixes of that. Um, and at some point or other in my writing, I stopped giving that. Yeah. And I think that's when a lot of my readers said, damn it, even when you ranted, you know, you were entertaining and so on, and you at least kind of pointed the finger at what needed to change. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't do that anymore. And a lot of my readers are not very happy with that. I, I guess I was, I, I thank you for that. And I'm, I'm curious if um, what, what I thought I was hearing you say was that there was also a, a certain number of people that um, because you took on this particular non-duality track and particularly that there is no path to um, right. the, the enlightened state implied in, in your current you know, uh, orientation in this, that mm -hmm. that blew people out. Is that not? Yeah, what? that that was kind of the second wave of departures. I lost I lost quite a few when I became what's colloquially called a collapse nick <laughs> and people called me a defeatist and then i lost more when i said we have no free will because that was just like too outrageous for yeah. most people to to accept yeah and and that's fine i have good friends um the the women in my life uh, the, the the people that i love most don't really buy um the uh the non-duality stuff and I don't think they entirely buy the, 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 the inevitable collapse argument either, but that doesn't keep me from loving them. And, and you know, um, I think we can continue to, to live with people that, um, and to work and collaborate with people whose worldviews are different from ours. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to reading, I mean, you've only got so much time to invest. And generally speaking, I think most of it would rather invest our time and energy in stuff that reinforces, that, as I say, gives us that reassurance. Yeah. Or, um, <clears throat> or, or sparks, 
<coughs> excuse me, sparks new ideas in a way that is actionable. And I think that's the other part of what's discouraged a lot of people about my writing is, you know, when I say that we can't save our civilization from collapse, they say, well, okay, I might be willing to buy that argument if there was something we could do. And it's the same thing with the non-duality argument. They might, they, they say, well, I might be willing to entertain the idea of not having free will if there was something that we could do about it. Mm -hmm. um, but since I offer no hope <laughs> in either argument, um, that's where they part company. You know, I'm, I'm curious, um, when I hear you map out that particular part of your readership and your relationship with them and so on, um, a piece that I, I'm wondering if it's present in what you're describing, but you're just not mentioning it, or if it's just not a part of what, you know, how you experience this whole topic is um, my orientation when I hear you describe those folks who are having a hard time with you saying, there's no hope, you know, right. we're out of here, there's no path to enlightenment, so things are looking pretty bad, whatever. The G word. <laughs> is that what you're going to say? Um, no, the word I, what, grief. What's the G word? Grief. Oh, grief. Yes, it actually is a part of massive part of it. Is right. you know what is the quality of my relationship with the web of life? Right. Which obviously implies other people, my own inner wisdom, and and Earth, you know itself, uh, and and what to me that's plenty of what's there to do about it. Yep. Like, that's a life's worth. That's all that's ever, you know, if I could really get out on the skinny branches here, I'd say that's all that the secret teachings, the ancient wisdom uh, practices have ever pointed people toward is a life of full presence. And ideally, if we're lucky, we get um, moments or possibly even big chunks of our life in which our our experience of that non-duality that i i tend to call it grace i'm not a religious person at all but that's just the word that has mm -hmm. time and again come um i can't imagine any anything more aspirational anything more worthy of doing in the face of some right. pretty, you know awful looking future um can you can you respond to that? Yeah, I think I'm also involved with the transition movement. I don't know if you know anything about it. The transition town started in Totnes in the UK. And I don't share their optimism that we're going to be able to make a successful transition, but I like the idea of doing things together. And I think to the extent that we we focus on local actions, I think we can make a difference. In the long run, it's not going to make any difference, but that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. We can make things better together at a local level now, and that's enough. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of joy and a lot of learning um, that can come from, from doing that. Um, when I made the, when I concluded that civilization culture couldn't be saved, and again, when I um, accepted the basic message of non-duality, most people found those to be very depressing. I found them both to be liberating, but that may be my nature. I mean, it may be the, the reason why I don't feel grief, and I've never really felt grief, although I've felt lots of sadness in my life, Maybe just the fact that I'm selfish or that I'm... Um, unattached to um, just the, the emotional impact of things, or somehow I've become inured to the, the pain of some of these things. That's possible. Um, and I was reading some interesting research uh, recently that said that somewhere between 20 and 50% of people when a loved one dies do not feel the symptoms of grief 
based on certain criteria that, um, and I think there's all kinds of different reasons for that. But I do acknowledge that most of the people that I know and care about do feel a lot of grief. And I think my big learning uh, recently is that just because I don't feel it doesn't mean that there isn't a task for me to be sensitive to and empathetic with the grief that others feel. Yeah. Understand where it comes from and to help them work through that. Yeah. Um, and so that's been a good lesson. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, um, I just feel inclined to, to kind of offer a, a little s extra sliver of, of my take on that, my experience of this is um, I, I really like using the, the words um, that, that Francis Weller talks about, um, and actually Carolyn too, they did a, an online summit a couple of years ago and they, they called it the flatline culture. Right. And um, that's very much my experience. In, in this training work that I've done forever, it, it was always based on doing the stuff before trying to offer it in the, in the training environment for other people. And that meant diving pretty deep, you know, and, and really uh, kind of kicking out the, the limitations that we seem to have culturally on the highs and lows in our emotional expression. And, um, and I have found that to be um, a scary, for people, an invitation that's scary for people when I've included that kind of work in, in the, excuse me, the various kinds of seminars and so on that I lead. Um, and certainly in my own experience, that's been, that's been the best way for me to go about it. Because it's not that at all that I don't experience grief. I do. Um, but it's, it's never really shown up for me as the at the scale that someone like Francis or oftentimes Carolyn and heck I've, you know, I've led a number of grief rituals myself. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I guess I'm positioning myself somewhere between you who's describing yourself as maybe not as engaged with grief as, as most people. Right. Or uh, someone like, uh, like Francis or, or Carolyn, who's got, um, the scale of and the importance of the gateway of grief is is far larger for them than it, it tends to be for me. It's a it's far more useful to hold it as the entirety of our range, our emotional range, our our ability to be present to a large scale expression and also to to express a large scale of expression. So, right. Um, thanks for sitting through that. I just needed to to kind of say it for myself to position myself because i I really appreciate that you are um, one of a very small handful of people that I've heard really articulate it that your involvement with grief is minimal. So thanks for that. It is true, but what I'm learning is that regardless of your take on that, probably the most important thing that we can be doing right now is learning to pay attention. And that's paying attention out, um, including to the feelings of others and how they're dealing with it. And also paying attention in um, to what's going on inside us um, because we're not gonna be much use to the world if we're just internally a mess. So we need to do some internal work on that as well. Um, and I found that what everybody seems to have in common is a sense that there's something terribly wrong <laughs> uh, with how we live. But there's no consensus on what exactly that is. There's not even a, a sense of real assurance about what it is. It's just kind of, and I think it's part, part of what's behind that feeling of grief that many people carry um, is, this sense that something isn't right, but they don't know what it is. And it's, it's infuriating, it's annoying, it's, um, it's, it causes grief to, 
to sense that there is something that needs to be done or seemingly needs to be done, but not to know what that is. It's kind of like when, you know, somebody that you meet or know is going through a terrible time and you just feel completely helpless because you don't know what you should be doing to help them through what they're going through. Um, so I've tried, I've tried to focus on things where I think I can be of some use. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I got involved with after I retired was a project called Group Works. Mm -hmm. uh, and this actually turned out to be a card deck of um, kind of best practices for ways in which you can help facilitate group activities, meetings, conferences, circles, you know, it doesn't have to be a formal setting. Um, and a lot of that is about paying attention. It's about understanding what is actually going on in the room with those people. And that's, you know, reading their body language. Um, so we ended up, 50 people were involved in this, this group works deck. Um, and we ended up with 92 patterns of things that seem to be helpful in helping group work move forward more productively. And I would say about a half of those are more or less about paying attention, being more aware of what's going on in the room, what's going on in the heads and the hearts of the other people in the room, what's going on inside yourself, and helping to improve that dynamic. And that's been enormously valuable to me because I came from a corporate culture where, you know, basically emotions were not welcome in meetings. <laughs> so it was a, almost a complete relearning for me after I retired to discover ways in which we can work better as a group. And that that group setting, to some extent, who we are is is not much more than a reflection of our interactions with other people. Mm -hmm. We grow most when we are with other people, not when we're hidden away by ourselves. Um, and so an awful lot of personal growth, I think, and personal learning and dealing with things like anger, grief, um, sorrow, fear in my case, which is a has always been uh, my big bugaboo, um, is for the most part about working with other people, being really being with other people and paying attention to what's going on mm -hmm. and you know, communicating that attention to other people in such a way that you, you get a common understanding. And once you've got a com common understanding that it's much easier to, to move forward. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you bringing that up. That was definitely uh, the, the direction I wanted to go around this point in our talk. I'm curious, um, did, did you get to practice with that deck much with other groups other than this kind of sounds like this foundational or formation group about the group works deck itself? Did you get it? Yeah, I'm, I mean, every group interaction I get involved with, I'm involved right now with an arts council. Um, and we applied that a lot of that thinking to developing the uh, the cultural plan for our little island for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And a number of people who've seen lots of cultural plans, which tend to be pretty boilerplate, have said ours is so innovative that they have sent it off to places all over the world. And I think it's largely because it was focused around listening. When we did the cultural plan, we didn't send out surveys with, you know, on a scale of one to five kind of things. Mm -hmm. we, we did, we recorded video interviews with people in the community and we asked them some questions, but we basically let the discussion go wherever it was going to go. And the insights that we got from those conversations, just from paying attention to what they were telling us, was way more than we could have got, I think, from any of the traditional information gathering ways. I'm also involved with the uh, transition movement, as I indicated, and I try to apply as much as I've learned about that paying attention. Part of the transition movement is something called inner transition 
which is really all about how you process the grief, the, the core of grief that seems inevitable to most people when they come to the realization that, you know, the world, the natural world that we love um, is teetering on the edge of collapse. Um, so there's opportunities to apply it there. Every time that you are, even in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, uh, there's opportunities to apply this and to learn how to listen better, how to pay more attention, um, how to empathize. And I'm at a very early stage in doing this. I, you know, as I say, I, I came from a very different culture mm -hmm. and I am in awe. I just love to watch people who are much better at this than I am. They're my, uh, they're the leaders of the future. And they, it's interesting, they come in all age groups and all shapes and sizes. Um, and uh, they're the ones that we're gonna have to, to watch and nurture in the coming years. Hmm, got it. I'm curious if, if you have um, somewhere in your back pocket suggestions or things that you have found valuable to keep yourself present, to keep yourself uh, emotionally available uh, to the people around you and, you know, basically conscious and connected. If you would, if, if you have those kind of things that you can call up and recall and, and share, and if you would be willing to share them with us um, in the name of, um, I, I think this is one of the most valuable ways we can share with one another really from here on is to share what, what helps us be more fully present in life on a day-to-day -day basis, no matter what our orientation to the inevitability of collapse or the good, bad, or indifferentness of the systems in place and blah, blah, blah. I think all of us are, are always a bit hungry for ways that we can feel more connected and more present. Do you have anything to offer? Yeah, I, I've got some things that I do on a number of different levels and some of them might sound a little off the wall, but I'll throw them out there anyway. The fundamental way in which I think I've learned to deal better with the world is through physical habits, primarily diet and exercise. Um, I used to eat the the horrible, you know, normal Western diet with a lot of processed foods and so on. Um, and I have become a vegan, but it's not veganism per se that I think is important. It's eating natural foods, unprocessed foods, eating them in balance and avoiding an excess of the kinds of ingredients in foods that cause an awful lot of, of uh, our illnesses these days. And since I've started eating better, um, I, uh, can I throw in a plug for my favorite website on this? Do. <laughs> it's called, it's called nutritionfacts.org. It's run by a, a retired doctor named Michael Greger. It's a totally nonprofit. You know, he has no ax to grind and he basically has a staff of 20 something and they synthesize and report on all of the research that's being done in the medical literature on the connection between nutrition and health, hmm. um, which is long overdue. But so much of the stuff that's being done is sponsored by the big food industry, mm -hmm. and big pharma, and so on. And so it's a great voice of reason in that. So I've improved my diet, and that has helped my mindset enormously. I get a lot of exercise um, as well, and that has been very helpful. I mean, those were the two keys to recovering from the, the horrible bout of ulcerative colitis. It was kind of my body saying no uh, about 15 years ago. Um, and uh, uh, that was how I healed, it was by improving diet and exercise. 
On another level, I guess I have learned from some of the people that I've met since I've retired more about self-awareness and authenticity in communicating with other people. Mm -hmm. So those are skills that I was not very good at because they were not encouraged or rewarded and they didn't necessarily make me feel very good. Yeah. It was sometimes better to be oblivious. <laughs> and I think that's true for most people. Oh, um, yeah. oh, so yeah. when, I, when I met these people who basically said, if you want to be in a relationship with me, you're going to have to face this stuff. You're going to have to face it in yourself. You're going to have to face it in me and in the other people that we relate to because that's the way we live. Um, and those people have helped me to achieve a much higher level of self-awareness and to also learn from them about what's really going on in other people um, as well. So I am now able, I think, to engage with people at a better level. I mean, I'm, as I say, I'm just starting this. This is uh, baby steps, starting all over again for the third or fourth time. But I think this is the key, is to, is to be, in, increase your self-awareness. When you find yourself reacting to something, to catch yourself and say, okay, what's going on there? What's the cause for that? Where did that, where did that come from? Um, because you have to be self-aware before you can start healing that. And the fundamental lesson, I think, of all of these learnings that I've had is that we're all healing. Uh, we've all got this heavy load that we're carrying. We've all got either trauma or grief or sorrow or something in our background um, that is making it much harder for us. And self-awareness is a big step towards that. That's all, that's all I got so far. No, that, that's plenty, and I appreciate it, especially that last part about trauma. Um, both Carolyn and I have had a, quite a bit of insight and experience with that in the past year in particular, and we're, we're putting together a, an online summit of, of folks who are really adept and really knowledgeable about um, the, the notion of, of how trauma lives in our body and lives in our experience and impacts us for years if we don't mm -hmm. find a way to work it. Have you read uh, Michael Pollan's new book? I have not. I, I'm a long time um, something of an aficionado and a long time fan of um, right use of hallucinogenics and mm -hmm. I'm thrilled that it's getting airplay i don't care who brings it forth and so yeah. I'm, I'm happy to read it i i've not really liked his style much in terms of the food stuff that he's done i you know there i think there are people that do, do that very far better i i don't have anything to say because i haven't read anything about his book yet or, or right. have i read his book so don't know yeah, i'm i'm not necessarily a fan of hallucinogenics either um but he makes some interesting points about the, the capacity of some of these with the right guidance. And he's talking about them as a therapy, yeah. not, as a rec not as a recreation. Yeah. Um, with the right guidance to help one understand what is behind that grief, yep. fundamentally. To give you kind of a break from yourself and allow to see yourself kind of from the outside instead of from this tumultuous, impossible inside where you just can't, can't see yourself accurately. Yep. The other individual who I greatly admire who's been dealing with grief, addiction, depression all of his life is a, is a Vancouver doctor by the name of Gabor Maté. Yeah. You've probably heard of him as well. Absolutely. I'm a big fan. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and what he says about, you know, again, the, 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 the sad news from him is that the best way for us to deal with grief is to prevent it happening in the first place through more compassionate, intelligent parenting yeah. 
than has been happened because an awful lot of the grief that people are facing, I have discovered, um, has come from childhood, traumatic childhood activity yeah. of some kind or other. Um, so what Gabor says uh, and what Mike, Michael Pollan is now starting to say about this, I think it's an, a really interesting avenue and maybe our best bet um, for dealing with this um, until such time as we can actually prevent it. Because that's, that's the only long-term solution to this. We got to stop bringing up generations of people who are living with trauma from a very early age. I don't think we intend to hurt people, but boy, it's, it's a serious uh, problem. Yeah, there's a, a recent, video that Carolyn and I did together uh, talking about kind of the shadow elements at the cultural and global level and our, the particular focus in the video clips we used for this uh, piece was uh, uh, Rex Tillerson and and it was an extraordinary I you're welcome to to check it out it's um, I'll, I'll give you the link later mm -hmm. um, the, the kind of the punchline really was just look at how seamless his presentation uh, from his extraordinary high role is is very um impactful dominant role in our culture that him representing the entire fossil fuel industry and so on and to watch him display the way that that traumatizing information and traumatizing structures that are implied in how a leader like him talks, mm -hmm. how he delivers it, what he's saying. And it can be wrapped up to look like, here's daddy. Yep. Or here, even better, here's the soft-spoken granddaddy. And grandpa's just gonna take care of you. You just yep. sit back and I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest to you just what the best way is to be alive and be happy and have a good life and here you go. And so uh, I appreciate what you just said about trauma and the, the grief that might well come about later in a life as that trauma and the grief itself is not digested, is not uh, metabolized in our systems. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm not, uh, that, that's a particular part of our world that I'm not very hopeful about also. That uh, this is deep and hard work for people, even if they've got a circle of friends who are supportive around them and they're completely on board and willing, it's tough work. And for the, for the vast majority of people in cultures around the world, but especially in the USA, I'm not holding my breath. Yeah, I get, I get some hope from, I actually love working with young people, even though they are, they are, many of them are total space cadets in terms of their understanding of what's actually going on in the world and what's happening. Um, and I suspect we probably were too, if I was to be honest, going back and looking what, uh, what I was like at 20 or something like that is, is um, but, um, uh, I do think that there is, there is a lot of hope in what's, what's happening with the, with the younger generation. I think they are, um, I think they are more social than the last two or three generations have been. Um, for better and for worse, it means that they're more vulnerable to uh, groupthink mm -hmm. than I think previous generations have been. But uh, um, they, I think they're more sensitive to each other, and I think that's a, that's a, a positive step. Got it. You know, now I, I'm regretting going quite so dark and quite so extreme in the last thing I said about, you know, how I don't hold out much hope. I think it's worth mentioning, um, like the young people you're talking about, I have been struck uh, in, in the process of writing my book, I've, I've connected up with a couple of associations 
that are doing extraordinary work and they're um, right in the center of this, this cultural flow that's going on about um, introducing or describing or integrating uh, trauma awareness mm -hmm. in organizations from all the way down to family dynamics to any kind of business or organization or agency all the way out. And um, <clears throat> that, that is happening and it is happening on a huge scale. I live in a, an area <coughs> where the, um, the approximate population in the area is about 150,000. And uh, we had uh, sold out gatherings when uh, nationally known experts about this trauma awareness and resilience skills and so on, when they would come, uh, they could fill up, looked like two, three, four, five different venues, each with right. hundreds of people in them to talk about these issues. And these are people from all walks of life in the community and uh, lots of different government agencies and, and uh, uh, not-for-profit agencies and so on. So I, I do need to mention that to be fair. And mm -hmm. uh, ironically, that is somewhat hopeful for me. So I just wanted to, yeah. full, dis full disclosure there. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think what underlies that again is this everybody's got this feeling there's not there's something that's not quite right but that nobody nobody's able to quite put their finger on it until you know what it is you can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I sensed in a lot of people who are struggling. I also know that a lot of people who work with trauma and with uh, grief when they try to do it more than one-on-one -on -one or in very small groups, one of the things they're struggling with is the way in which it manifests itself as narcissistic behavior. Um, and that's a real challenge because, you know, if we're going to start to help to heal people in significant sized groups, you know, we kind of got to scale up from the one-on-one -on -one to, to do this, uh, um, in larger groups and the problem is when you deal with larger groups there is quite often one or two people um, with narcissistic narcissistic personalities who will just dominate things to the point where nobody else gets a, a fair shake and in fact you can actually end up with some negative effects where you get resentment and and so on coming out of it. So I greatly admire you for doing work in this space. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't presume to have anywhere near the competence to be able to deal with this. I'll, I'll settle for having learned a little bit about group process yeah. and how to help groups uh, avoid imploding and getting, um, you know, moving forward with their particular agendas, but dealing with the issue of grief, I think it's probably one of the greatest challenges that we have yeah. Um, in this current generation, and I don't, I don't know anybody who's got any answers that um, I think can be can be scaled up mm -hmm. to the point where we can start to heal, you know, whole large populations. Because you know, the very fact that that you get these kind of turnouts for these events, and uh, and I've seen it in a number of of settings indicate just how great the need is. Yeah. But uh, the problem is everybody's grief is different. Yeah. And how do you deal with it? How do you deal with that massive need of billions of people yeah. who are carrying this when you've only got a, a handful of resources to do it? And there's certainly not going to be any corporate or government money thrown towards it. Yeah. Yeah, well, actually, there there might be some, but I I do get your point, and that is kind of what was driving my my darker comment earlier. Um, Dave, we're coming up on the the end of our time, and I'm curious if you had a a far larger microphone than I can offer you. If you had uh, a few moments on um, I don't know one of the larger talk shows in the world, and and uh, a few, a few moments to, to really um, 
offer what you see and um, had the chance to uh, offer to folks that might be new to this, this whole conversation, um, what, what might you want to say? Um, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's, I think it was in the, the Once and Future King, the book, where um, somebody said, uh, one of the characters said, the thing to do when you're feeling sad is to learn something new. And so I think that would be my most important advice. The thing that turned my life around was when I had the luxury of the opportunity of the time and resources to learn some new things, to challenge everything that I had been told. Um, because I found that that new learning and that critical thinking were the absolute keys to healing, both internally healing myself and helping others to heal. Great. Um, Dave Pollard, it's just been a, a total joy to, to talk with you, and I hope that this is not our last time. I'd, uh, I'd love to make a regular habit of it if you could endure it. Uh, sure, I'd love to do that. I think we, we barely got started as far as I'm concerned, particularly about group stuff. And um, I'd, I'd like, there's a, a few of your writings that I'd like to spark off of if, if we get a chance to, to speak again. Um, there's really some lovely um, gold in each of your writings and I so appreciate Thanks. the time that you put into it over these years and uh, I wish you well in, in um, you know, perhaps cultivating a, an, an ever larger following. And um, yeah, I, I uh, feel like I've grown quite a bit in being exposed first to your writing and now to you in person. And I just really thank you for your work and thanks for spending time with me today. And I'd like to thank you as well for what you do. I mean, work helping people manage grief has got to be one of the most important jobs in the world and it's often a very thankless one so thank you for what you do oh, you're sure welcome thank you all right thanks for watching another episode of the poetry of predicament podcast produced by dean walker and the living resilience alliance www.livingresilience.net music today from michael hedges as always and also port blue into the sea you may want to check out our sister podcasts, the new Lifeboat Hour with Carolyn Baker on Podbean and at carolynbaker.net. Also, the Impossible Conversation podcast, another channel on YouTube. Thanks so much for joining us. Join us again later for another episode of The Poetry of Predicament.